I'm with Brad Matheson from Waymaker International. Now, Brad, what is Waymaker International? So Waymaker International really is our programming is that we exist to share the gospel by demonstrating God's love in real and tangible ways to the peoples of the Eastern Mediterranean so that they would choose abundant life over the ordinary life that they may have through Jesus Christ. And when was the organization started? Really, organization has been going on for a couple of years now. It's based out of the United States, and it was designed primarily as an outreach to the Levant people groups here in the Eastern Mediterranean. And you're based here in Betsahor. What programs do you do? Yeah. So when God led us here, and there's obviously a big backstory to how God led us to, to this spot, we really felt like the connection points for sharing Christ in unique ways here is going to be through the youth. And being here in Betsahor, you do see quite a bit of institutional, you know, in the, the religious environment here with not only the, you know, the, the Muslim population, but but in the Christian population, it's, you know, Orthodox and Catholicism. And so those are well established within the community here. And we feel like, you know, to, to try to present, you know, Christ in unique and ways, we, uh, you know, we do that through youth programming, such as, you know, just developing English classes, working on homework, youth activities. And, and it's not anything more than just to show the love of Christ to the kids so that we can develop relationships with them. Beit Soho is a Christian area. Are a lot of the Christians here cultural Christians, but not real believers? Yeah, I mean, statistics will tell you that. And, and when you're here in the town, you can see that as, as well. And that, that's really what kind of guided us here, is Beit Sahor, at least on paper, appears to be, you know, one of the larger Christian communities in the West Bank. But when you drill down and, and you look at, at specific true relationships with Christ, then those numbers become smaller and smaller. And it's evident as you, you sometimes you walk the city. It's a, it's a wonderful city. We love Beit Sahor so much. That's what attracted us to this village life that, that's here. But as, as you spend time with people, you see more and more the, the need for, for this love of Christ that, that will transcend the problems in, in people's daily lives. And that, that's where the rubber hits the road for us. We, just, we love to be able to develop those relationships and help people see and experience Christ in, you know, in different, different ways. So they, they really they exchange this ordinary hard life that they sometimes go through with an extraordinary life. And all those problems seem to fade away you know, whenever they become closer to Christ. So that's, that's really our ultimate goal here. Is it quite a challenge breaking through the tradition? It is in a lot of ways. It's generational. You know, it's obviously harder with, as people, as you start working and talking to people, um, it does get harder as that age goes up. So we felt like that if we can reach the, the youth then and gain some confidence and gain relationships that then that gives us an open door to be able to, you know, to be able to, to talk to parents and and, and grandparents, and develop those relationships, you know, to be able to allow people to see the love of Christ through what we're doing, and so that they can be impacted and see that's something that I kind of want. I want to have some of that, because it seems like that what you're doing is really different and unique, and, and that's what we want. We want to see those questions asked, you know, so that we can provide those kind of answers for them. Uh, you're working with Palestinian youth, and there is the Palestinian conflict, and life is difficult for young Palestinians. Is there a hunger for spirituality here? There is a hunger here specifically, and there's, there's a void. So what, what we're seeing is it's that personal connection between the established organizational, religious organizational groups and the people. And there's a disconnect. And so when that disconnect happens, there's always going to be a void, and that void will be filled by any number of things. Here in this area, there is a, it's disheartening, but there's a growing community of people who are, you know, seeking that new age movement and, and that spiritual enlightenment, and it, it's catching hold in this part of, of the city, and it, and it really is alarming to us, you know, and it, it just tells that there is a void in the younger generation to the mid-range generation. They want to see something that's different, and they're, and they're searching for something. 
And uh, we're hoping, you know, Christ will be that, but a lot of them are searching for spiritual enlightenment and awareness that is on a holistically different level than, you know, than what Christ would be presenting. Are many of them still wanting to leave today? You know, I, I think I think in this area, especially, you know, that's that's always a consideration. Beisahor and the Bethlehem area in general tends to be, in the Christian areas, tend to be a little bit more educated, and, and they see opportunity. They have family members that are in the United States and, and other places that are successful, and so they, they see the the thought of, of maybe moving to another country, um, joining with their family could be you know, it could be something that would, would benefit them, you know, rather than seeing, you know, staying here. And, and so that, that's hard to see too sometimes, you know. And you run a program called The Oasis. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so The Oasis is really just, we talk about a simple programming of just building relationships with the kids of Beit Zahor and showing God's love through that. And how we do that? We do it through English classes, you know, here uh, especially in this area, parents love for their kids to be around English speakers and especially, you know, Western English speakers because they love their kids to be able to, to know the language uh, because they believe that will provide them greater influence and greater, you know, stability in, in their lives. And so that's been a, an awesome thing to see. We've seen that. Also, homework is always a big deal here because for some of the kids who go to specialized schools like the American School here in, in Bejala, you know, they often go home with homework that their parents just cannot help them with. So we found a niche there to be able to provide some resource for parents. And all that really is done as a, as a reason just to, to get to know the kids and develop relationships and for them and their families to see the love of Christ through our actions. Do Palestinians know good English in general? You know, it's, that's a good question because they learn the things that they hear and see through media. There's not a lot of interaction with Westerners here, although there are some living in the cities here. And, you know, generally, the younger the, the population, the more English they speak, the older uh, the population, the less English they speak. But they're learning. They're learning more. And the thing is, they desire to speak English in the correct way, you know, and so... We see that as a, a real motivation to be able to help them and, you know, of course, long-range develop relationships. Uh, what other projects do you run? You know, primarily that's, that's our big project right now. Our goal is, is to kind of develop this oasis, we call this a waypoint here in, in Beit Zahor, and then expand, you know, expand the concept to other places in the eastern Mediterranean with the Levant people groups. You know, so what we, in the long-range goal of the organization is to create this mechanism, learn, and so we were able to learn the language, learn the customs, and develop our programming to meet the goals of this specific culture and the people group. And then it's easy, easier for us to then to duplicate that in other parts of the Mediterranean and, and see some of that work happen there. Now, you came over from the U.S. How did you become a believer? Well, through getting on a bus in rural Texas, and my mom put me on a bus and, and going to a, a local church. And I remember in the summer, I was probably about seven or eight years old, and went to a, what we called Vacation Bible School. And it was one of those events that, that I just I realized for the first time that there was Jesus Christ and, and God, and those, those things were much bigger than I was. And I realized the, the sin that I had in my life, and, and I saw what I wanted. It wasn't as much, although eternal life was a great thing, but I just wanted to, to have this, this spirit of Christ in me so that, that my life could be you know, different and challenged. And I saw that in other people, and I, I, the Holy Spirit just spoke to me. And, and uh, it was through that real personal relationship that, you know, I knelt and, and asked God, asked Jesus into my heart. And he came in and that changed my life forever at that point. And of course, just because you become a Christian doesn't mean life is easy. You've had some difficulties along the way. What sort of things have been happening? Yeah, well, you know, when we allow self to get in our way, and, and, and we all do that from time to time, in my instance, yeah, through my life, even though I, you know, I, I got my master's degree at a Baptist theological institution and, 
and was a, a minister in the church for years, had some ministry organizations. Yeah, my life was dysfunctional. You know, I, I had instances in my childhood where there was, there was abuse, and, and that carried through the rest of my life and challenged me. And through that, my, you know, my self, my desire for self-gratification and, and those, kind of, those kind of things really overshadowed a lot of what God could do through me. And it's through, you know, through a series of, of just, you know, as that spiral, and there's a whole backstory to this, how that spiral just went down and down and down, you know, through my 30s and 40s to eventually get into the point that God provides a valley sometimes. And, and those dark valleys that he provides allow for some incredible change that happens. And one of those happened to me, you know, a few years ago. And I'll say that God you know, Jesus will never turn his back on you, but sometimes he, he will step back and allow the consequences of your life to fall upon you in such a way to, to challenge and get you to change the direction of your life. And that certainly happened to me before in my life, there's no doubt. And so, you know, running through my 40s, we began a travel company, and the travel company was really, at first it was a missions organization, and we were we were planning mission projects around the world, and over the course of about 10 years, we were able to, you know, God allowed us to be able to do some of these projects in 40-plus countries, two or 300 projects with, with people all over the United States. And, and, you know, I just remember, I just remember that spiraling down of, of Brad's, you know, Brad's personal life. You know, there was, there was so much that happened that, you know, there was alcohol that got involved with, with all of that and, you know, just looking for any way out, you know, to, to run away from God. And, and it really was for me when you read the second chapter of Jonah, where, where Jonah was in the belly of the well, you know, there's a backstory to the Jonah story, right, that we really don't ever see and we probably won't know until we get to heaven. But, but the whole backstory of Jonah is the years that he probably ran away from God and in coming to a point where God had to actually present a dark valley in order for, for his life to be completely changed in the belly of the well. And he did that for me. I mean, for, for years, he, he nudges and he'll, he'll say, hey, you know, in your spirit, you're not going the right direction. And you ignore it and he ups the game and to eventually he'll, he'll do whatever he has to do in order to get you back on track. And for me, it was a whole crashing of our business. I mean, you know, a number of years ago, all that happened. It just, it happened around us. We allowed ourselves to be so self-absorbed, myself, to be so self-absorbed that we, you know, we, we didn't go the direction that we needed to go. And as a result of all that, our business failed. And when our business failed, you know, there was specific laws in a certain state in California that, you know, that got us to a point that, you know, we, through a series of unfortunate situations, although they're probably fortunate because I needed to go through them, you know, we crashed and we were, you know, we were in, uh, we were in jail for a year. And through that, that experience, God really brought to complete focus where my life had been and what the balance of my life could represent. It was a crossroads, you know, and those crossroads happen sometime in our life when circumstance crossroads with opportunity and that crisis point in our life, God provides for a change to happen in our life. And that, that was it for me, spending that time there, even though that the whole legality of that was was not right in the U.S. court systems. It really was meant for us to be there and to go through that opportunity. And 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 I remember a defining moment for me. It was right after we we were sentenced, and I remember going back into my little area there and just this heaviness falling upon me. And and I went through three days of of just complete darkness. You know where where that where God you know Jesus just stepped back a little bit and allowed allowed those things to fall upon me, um, the circumstances of my life to fall upon me, and the weight of all that. And it was through that, that great darkness in that valley that light sprang up. You know, you have to come to a point of ultimate brokenness. And not just brokenness in your mind, but complete brokenness in your heart where there's absolutely nothing left. And, and 
for me, that was that place. I planned at the end of that three day period, I was going to, I was going to commit suicide. I was going to, you know, I was going to grab, you know, in, in, in this system, you, you could get prescription pills from the other inmates. And I was just going to get enough of those to just end my life. That one night, I remember calling my aunt, you know, from jail and just saying, Hey, I want you to, you know, I want you to tell everyone, my wife and my kids, how much I love them. And, you know, not telling her what I was going to do. And, and I planned on getting off that phone call that night and going through with it. And she said, you know, before you get off, I just want to tell you uh, a message that Margie had given me. Margie was in jail 30 miles away from me, you know, and my aunt was the go-between for us. And she said, she said, Margie wanted to give you, uh, she'd just been praying for you in the light. And, and I just, I just, at that point, through a special passage in the Bible that she gave me, it just completely brought light into my mind and my heart. And I remember at that point, that's when Christ came back and he enveloped me. And in that brokenness that I went through was an amazing change in, in my life. And that was the very lowest I'd ever been in my life. And after that, you know, what I did was I, I asked God in the next three to four months to go into the garage of my life, that garage that, you know, that's there that we put all sorts of junk in our life. You know, it's like grandpa's garage. You walk into it and it smells and there's dust and, you know, there's things in there from 30 years. That was the garage of my life. So I asked God to come in and just work with me um, to be that person that would help me take each and everything out of that garage and clean that garage. And we did that through prayer and fasting over about three months. We got that garage cleaned up. We, we painted it. And then I asked God not just to change my life as far as my, my mind goes, but to, to really come in and change the DNA of who Brad was and to get rid of that old vine and that, that old soil and for him to reestablish a new vine and a new soil in my heart and in my mind. And I asked him specifically, I remember all these things that in my childhood that happened, you know, with the abuse and, and all the things through my teenage years. And, and I asked God just to, to cut those binds for me, you know, because what happens is those things tend to be a, a yoke around our neck and they, they uh, create those opportunities for us to fall back into sin. So I, I just wanted those to be cut. And I asked God through fasting and prayer, you know, God, just, just cut those, take those yokes off me. I can't do it. Cut away the, the bonds and the weights from Brad and create a brand new heart in me. And that's what he did. At the end of that process, we had a, a funeral service for the old Brad. And we, we planted that old Brad in the ground. And a fresh new Brad was born through all that. And people ask me, when I talk to churches and I speak a little bit, people ask me, you know, what that was like. And the closest thing I can come to it is having an identical brother. And that identical brother died, and he was buried. And I don't, I know him, I, I remember him, but I, I don't have any of the isms that came with that old person. All the stuff with, you know, the alcohol, with the, the self, you know, just the self being such a, a big part of my life, all that's gone. And, and God planted it with, with a renewed heart to be able to expend the rest of my life doing what I believe he's called me to, and that's to be right here. And now you're here in the Middle East. How did God call you here? Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting story. So, you know, Margie and I were separated for a year, each in our own little habitats. <laughs> and uh, we, we weren't able to talk to each other, weren't able to write letters to each other. But both of us were going through our own path, our own dark valleys, um, to get to the place where God would present new challenges to us. And during that time, obviously, when, when you go through this valley and God renews that spirit in you, the next logical thing is, what's my next step? You know, my life had, had cascaded to nothing. I mean, through all this, most of my friends left. We had a, a yacht in the Caribbean. We had a, a big condo in downtown Atlanta. We had, you know, we had the BMWs. All that was gone. You know, I literally had no money no friends, and but I was the happiest I'd ever been. And during that time, I'd asked my my aunt to tell Margie to be begin praying about what we're gonna what we're gonna do. 
And we, we prayed that separately. And so the very first night that we got out, I remember we just stayed up all night long in a hotel just talking. And I told her, I said, you know, Marge, I just want to tell you that I feel like God's calling us to this part of the world to work with this specific people group. And, and she just looked at me and she said, listen, the only time I've ever had a vision was three months ago. And that vision was you and I walking down Star Street in Bethlehem and people coming out and, um, you know, just saying our name. And, uh, and, and that's just the, the incredible architect of his hand, isn't it? That he would place upon her heart at the same time he placed upon my heart. And who, I mean, who would have thunk it? And then we got together and we knew, we knew without a shadow of doubt that God was calling us here. He had brought us through a great valley in our life. And that valley was a wonderful experience for us to actually go through. And he architected the entire time for us to be able to come here. And now, now we're here and we're serving. We love it. Every single day we wake up and, and we look on this city of Bethlehem. And we think how, how fortunate we are, you know, how fortunate we are to be here, not in the city of Christ's birth, but to be here amongst the people and to, and to show the love of Christ, you know, of what he's done with us what he's done through us and how he's changed my life and, and how that story can, you know, hopefully help others as well. Are you seeing a difference here? We are. It's a challenge. You know, it's, it's an uphill battle, but we are seeing a difference here. We're seeing, we're seeing people not only in the Christian areas, but in the Muslims area too. We see people that are just being attracted by the light. And they, they want to see something different. They want to experience something different. It's a slow process. It's relationship development. And but we are seeing a difference. And, and hopefully, as, as God continues to bring volunteers and, and we're, we're stay true to that focus that he has, we're going to see him succeed in this area and, and it's spreading his good news, you know, and just the wonderful challenges and changes that people can have through it. What's your prayer here for the Bethlehem area? Prayer for the Bethlehem area is that people will exchange an ordinary life for a powerful, extraordinary life through Jesus Christ. That they, they go from the worries and the stresses of ordinary life, families, you know, how am I going to make it next week with food and, and gas and, and the struggles of, of the oppression? I mean, all that stuff that God can come in and through that direct relationship with Jesus Christ, all those things become less that burden becomes not much on their shoulders but it's shared with christ and christ can protect and can guide and and influence and that's that's our greatest pair is that people will exchange an ordinary hard life no matter how hard their their physical and emotional states are that that christ can come in and make those more manageable and that people will have a greater sense of, of relationship with him you have a website. What's your website address for people who'd like to know more about you and the work that you do? Yeah, so the website is uh, waymakerinternational.org, and that tells a little bit of information on the, on the ministry. It tells in more in depth on our story, our backstory, and, and you know, what, what we're trying to accomplish and, and do. Okay, Brad, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Appreciate it so much, and may God bless.